My talk is actually kind of the biology that sets up Dr. Liberace's talk. And it's a kind of a review a little bit back to high school biology, which was for many of you a few decades ago. Um, but we're going to have a little bit of an outline of the menstrual cycle. It will look a little familiar. Familiar. We'll talk a little bit about um, the normal hormonal fluctuations that occur in every young woman. We'll talk about some words that may be familiar or unfamiliar to you, including catamenial or menstrual epilepsy, which is when seizures are somehow linked to the menstrual cycle. And we'll talk about menopause. And I think this is an, in in an interesting quote. The menstrual cycle is a direct communication between your brain and your body. So hormones, part of this talk is really about hormones, and not to be scary, thinking back about biology, said I haven't said that word in such a long time. But hormones are essentially chemical messengers which are produced in one part of the body and act upon another. And they could be produced by a gland, a cell, or an organ. So we have hormones produced in our brain, which we often forget about, but we have hormones produced in the ovaries and the testes, the estrogen and progesterone that people talk a little bit more about. And of course, you've all heard about steroid hormones, and most of you probably don't say the word adrenal gland too often, but those are, are words that would be familiar. Hormones have to travel to a target organ and that target organ has to have receptors. Remember Dr. Sperling talked about, showed you different kinds of genetics and epilepsy and he showed you receptors and now you feel like you're ready for your PhD in neuroscience, but he, he showed you <laughs> those receptors. Now, hormones can have a lot of different effects on the body. We don't have to go through all of these. Um, obviously, they, the hormones are necessary to grow um, at tall or not so tall. Um, hormones regulate metabolism. You might have even known somebody who took uh, supplemental hormones and gained or lost weight. Um, we don't really use, as human beings, too much the hormones for fighting, flighting, or fleeing. But when you have feel when you have an anxiety attack, some of those uh, anxiety those uh, those hormones are also activated, and obviously the hormonal psych structure is important for the development before, uh, that is part of puberty, and then reproduction, and then menopause. Um, as humans, we may be more or less influenced by the effects of our hormones. So some parts of it are biology, but other parts of it, you know, obviously we can um, override those and we have rational thought. So I'm going to go through a lot of different kind of sociological stuff that you might not have thought about. And um, as women, we're influenced our bodies, but we really define ourselves, right? We have menstrual cycles, we have good days, we have bad days, we have uh, days where we have horrible morning sickness and we still show up for work on time. Um, and again, we're influenced by our bodies and we define ourselves. Um, going back to some of the historical aspects, so menstruation is actually something that people used to never talk about, and um, you are seeing more discussion in, the, in our society. Uh, this is one specific example. There are many, and these examples are only maybe at the most five years old, and so these are um, uh, feminine hygiene products that have been made pretty and fun and cute for, for teenagers, right? They come wrapped in neon colors now. Um, uh, again, um, we're seeing more of an, of an outspokenness and a ways, different ways for women to communicate either publicly or even online blogs, other places. Um, the last time I gave this talk, I had some cartoons from an, a company, uh, a site called the Society for Menstrual Research, which you can still go and look up. And there, they actually have um, pretty good information and, and so forth, but you can also see the threads of discussion that women have that say, well, I'm having this problem, or I got put on this for contraception, and it's making my periods like this and this. And, and, and you can actually see that there is a clear d discussion among women, or even reference to articles, which is interesting. Now, um, for those of you who might be familiar with uh, this um, show, Orange is the New Black on Netflix, anybody see this one? A few people have. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's based a, a sort of on the real life story of a woman who went to uh, prison and her year there. And, um, and one of the key plot devices is how the women, all prisoners, usually manage to manipulate the guards by just mentioning something about their period. And immediately they get what they want. And it pushes the envelope um, it, a, a, in many different envelopes. But it's certainly um, on Netflix and um, a, a number of jokes that I certainly have never, had never heard before. Again, another example 
of women really taking control of their bodies. So Men Menopause the Musical, I believe, is more than a decade old. It was a landmark, um, a landmark uh, piece of theater. And I can't believe, but next time Joyce invites me to give this talk, I should have included the vagina monologues. <laughs> so again, the things that we used to not talk about, people do talk about. And, um, and even if you don't have so many people that you're comfortable talking about, um, there's certainly good online platforms to learn about things. All right. So some of the key hormonal processes, one of, well, the key hormonal process for women with epilepsy is the menstrual cycle. And again, a little bit of biology. Um, puberty is the two-year process that builds up to when the girls first get their periods. And menarche is the word that we use for when the period starts. Um, and there are a number of different factors that can be involved, including biology, environment, and genetics. And if you were listening to NPR and a lot of different things, we know, you might know that girls now get their periods younger than they did 20, 30 years ago. Um, and in point of fact, um, you know, once upon a time, early breast development for girls was sometimes a marker that they might be getting their period too early. That, that, that doesn't really hold true so much anymore. And um, once upon a time, it was thought that when a girl gets her period, she's not going to grow any taller. Well, plenty of girls now are getting their periods at 10 and 11, and they still grow. So the stuff that if you're even only 30 that you learned when you were 15 doesn't exactly apply as much now as it, as it did. And um, nobody's older than 30 here, so don't worry about that. Um, the monthly menstrual cycle, again, for many women, is a point at which their seizures can be more concerning. And then perimenopause. Perimenopause is a sneaky transition that occurs before a woman's periods stop. And um, that can be very slow or insidious. Um, some women are aware of some of the symptoms, and sometimes they, they feel like they can't do 100% of the things that they did before. So they might be having disrupted sleep, and they're a little bit more tired during the day, and not really aware of hot flashes or other symptoms. Um, and as we talked about before, if you have epilepsy, it's a little harder to do away with a little less sleep. And um, it's a little harder if you have epilepsy to multitask. And sometimes things are a little more fragmented there. And menopause is when our periods stop. And, and it, now in 2015, as adult women, we're going to spend at least a third of our lives in menopause, perhaps even longer. Um, in any case, um, we, we kind of have really talked a little bit about this, but the age at first period is dropping, um, and there are a number of different factors that can be um, important. One of the issues for women with epilepsy, the WWE, is that um, there are a number of different epilepsy syndromes where the first seizure might occur around the time the girl gets her first period. One epilepsy syndrome, that is an, which is an example, is juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, where sometimes that's when the, the, the youngster first has a tonic-clonic seizure, and it's recognized then, and you know, in, in the family's mind, it's always linked. And um, for women who have complex partial epilepsy, the, um, occasionally they've had smaller seizures when they were smaller, but really around the time that they get their first period, that's really when they start to have um, more clear complex partial seizures. Um, so there are some key points for women with epilepsy and women in general. You could divide all of these issues into the reproductive years. And in the reproductive years, we want to think about contraception and pregnancy planning. We also want to think about sexuality, which can be different for women with epilepsy. Of course, catamenial epilepsy. And then once a woman's decided that she's done having her family, that her childbearing years are over, um, she might actually want to make changes in whatever form of contraception that she uses when she's no longer planning to have any more children. Um, perimenopause is a cascade of changes, including memory and sexuality. So um, if, for, as a woman with epilepsy, the person felt, you know, I feel like my body doesn't respond sexually the same way that others do, um, that can be a point where there's another transition. Um, and obviously, in the perimenopause, there are a lot of different physical symptoms that women can have. Not every woman recognizes that she's in menopause or perimenopause. And so um, that fragmented sleep, a little difficulty with concentration, um, perhaps the fluctuation in, in hormones leading to depression, 
um, can all be factors, and I've certainly had, and I don't know if the other physicians in the room have had the same uh, feature, I've had patients who confuse their hot flashes with their seizures, that the physical symptoms were actually similar. Um, and then one of the things about menopause is that the age at menopause is determined by many factors, and epilepsy is one of them. Um, and so women with epilepsy may have menopause a little earlier. Another factor is that some women would say at menopause, well, uh, you know, what, what do you got, doc? You know, what, what are your patches, pills, whatever? And for others, they may say, you know, I, I take medicine for everything. I don't want to add one more. I want to have a more natural experience. Don't medicalize it. And then a third aspect is, is that some women with epilepsy and all kinds of women have other medical problems, whether they're hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, that might make it harder for them to take some of the menopausal um, uh, prescription medications. Now, we're going back to high school biology again a little bit, and some people say, no, no, that I, I slept through that. But in the menstrual cycle, there are three phases. It's um, it start, the menstrual cycle starts when the period starts. The first phase is called the follicular phase. The middle of the cycle is ovulation, where a person could become pregnant. The luteal phase is the end of it. And in this um, graph, we can see that um, we have estrogen, which is here in this yellowish gold, and we see that it gradually increases, peaking at ovulation and dropping off later. And um, in the first half, the, the cycle hormones are increasing, peaking at ovulation, declining in the second half. If pregnancy does not occur, then menstruation happens. And that's some, one, one of the key points. Um, so that just before the woman has a period, both estrogen and progesterone drop. Again, here's an up-close cycle, again, with our goal, estrogen and progesterone. Um, and um, when we say how is, how is the brain involved, well, one of the things that, that tells, the, tells the body to make estrogen and progesterone is in the hypothalamus, hypothalamic pituitary area, and that's going to send um, hormones to the ovaries that make this whole cycle. What is also important is that there are hormonal receptors in the brain for estrogen and progesterone. That would make sense, right? Mm -hmm. So that hormones from the ovaries are going to come back and cycle back in the brain. Um, when we think about women who have what we call catamenial seizures, has nothing to do with cats, don't know how they got that name, um, those are the seizures that are linked to fluctuations in estrogen and progesterone in, in the female brain. Estrogen's a normal hormone. Women are supposed to have it. It does a lot of good things. But if the balance between estrogen and progesterone is off, it means that the women can be more likely to have seizures. In a sense, progesterone has a role in protecting against seizures. So it's not necessarily for women who have this kind of epilepsy, their estrogen and progesterone isn't off. They can have the same estrogen and progesterone that everybody else has. What happens is, is their brain doesn't like that balance. Does that make sense? So there's nothing, there's nothing wrong here, but what happens is, is the brain receptors are, are not responding the way that they otherwise would. If we take laboratory animals um, and we take female, usually it's rodents, right, mice, we can create these models of premenstrual epilepsy in our female mice, but we can't do it in males. So it's something unique to the female brain. There are lots of great, wonderful things, but this one, if you happen to have premenstrual seizures, is not one of them. Now, um, don't freak out. This is another scientific slide, but there are three patterns of premenstrual epilepsy, and we talked about the follicular, ovulatory, and luteal phase. Some women have the seizures when, when they ovulate, when it cycles. Some women have it in the second half of the, half of the cycle, especially if they didn't ovulate. And some women with epilepsy are, less, are a little more likely to have cycles where they don't ovulate. And the, the third is really right, um, right before the, a woman gets her period. One of the things that we hear from, as doctors is, um, from a lot of women is that um, women often say, oh, 
you know, I know I have this feeling like I, I know in my body I'm about to get my period. It's not going to be a good one. I feel, I feel like I'm going to have seizures before my period. We hear that a, a lot. Um, now, one aspect of this is, 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 it, is, it, is it a problem in the brain? Is it a problem in the brain receptors? Um, or is it the drugs? And some of our seizure medications actually with normal fluctuations of the hormones and the hormonal metabolism occasionally can drop right before a woman gets her period. And so, so it can be a problem with the brain receptors here, or it could be a problem actually with um, the pharmacology and the medication levels dropping. Um, additionally, d it depends on the kind of epilepsy. So women who have epilepsy that localizes to the temporal lobes are more likely to have this pattern. Um, Dr. Liparacci is going to talk a little bit about um, contraception and birth control, but a few things to remember. So if you're in this room, that means in a sense you're an epilepsy educator. Um, and if you're old enough to have gray hair, you might not be, at, in, unless you work with young people, you might not know all of the issues that they work, that, that, they're, that, they're, that are fundamental to their sexual education. But obviously, safe sex and contraception are two different issues. So we recommend that everybody ha practice safe sex and use condoms, but, but condoms are not actually one of the most effective methods of contraception. Some um, social or historical aspects, 30% of women try five or more different forms of birth control, right? There are all kinds of things, depending, you know, things that you might know from watching television, rings, patches, um, injections of this and that. But 30% um, of women try five or more. The other thing that you might um, not, the condoms are recommended for all young people for, as part of safe sex, but um, the plan B and the emergency contra use of emergency contraception is also rising, particularly in young populations. And, um, and in general, in American, for American women, um, about 80% of American women at some point in their life have used the pill. Um, and in post-clinical trials, the failure rate of the pill is 11%, which means like in research studies, it's very, very low. But when people actually have to take a pill every day, sometimes they forget. So the, the likelihood of getting pregnant on the usual pill in, in, you know, when we look at all Americans, not people with epilepsy, all American women is actually higher. Um, and then who uses what is, is of interest. So um, people tend to use what their friends use. Um, and so, and but one other question almost is, is does, so as a doctor, sometimes you ask, then do doctors offer people like what they think they're gonna want? Do you know, or do they offer them all of the choices? But, you know, the choice of contraception isn't, isn't always 100%. The woman and her doctor, often the woman comes in and says, all my girlfriends tried this, it's steak, I want this other one, because they all said it was great. So, so um, there's a lot of, of different component uh, uh, issues. Um, so one of the factors for women and teens with epilepsy to consider, um, and that are important, are um, in choice, are um, um, how many partners the patient's having, um, and whether or not um, the woman plans to have children in the future. So if she's absolutely clear that she's done having a family, it doesn't make sense for her to something that has a high failure rate, but it makes more sense to choose something that, that is um, clearly going to be helpful. It's always important to know, and Dr. Liparachi is going to go over this more about the interaction between seizure medicines and contraception, and the tolerability of the contraceptive. Um, mechanisms. So things that contain hormonal, act, that are hormonally active, whether that's an injection or a pill, um, women are more likely to change from those treatments because they have trouble tolerating the, the hormonal method. Um, and then um, uh, one of the, the, the long-term um, ability to use it, retain it, and not get pregnant is important. So um, one new concept is that IUD, Im, IUDs and implants have the lowest failure rate in the United States currently at less than 1%. So if we take a theoretical, uh, say we have a 15-year-old who has poorly controlled epilepsy and is very impulsive and is having a lot of unsafe sex, that can happen, right? They're, they're definitely troubled teens like that. Then, um, then um, for that particular youngster or young woman, um, obviously, we have a lot of work to do to get everything under control for her, but 
um, an IUD or an implant would be better than an oral contraceptive because she has trouble remembering to take it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so, and globally in the U.S., there's a it, there's a thought now that the current IUDs are actually so safe that those should be used for sexually active teenagers who don't have their lives together. The other thing that's important to keep in mind is whether or not the person can get back to clinic to change their con method of contraceptive. So if you put in a five-year marina and they can't get back, that's a problem. A little bit about um, PMS pre and premenstrual mood disorder and menstrual dysphoric disorder. So, you know, we talk about it, and, and, but when we look at actually the research for this, um, prospective, from the Society for Menstrual Research, um, prospective, well-founded, good research that suggests that all women have PMS or premenstrual dysphoric disorder is lacking. And that even if you might be grumpy, you know, today or six times a year, um, to make broad generalizations about, um, about PMS and premenstrual dysphoric disorder is apparently not necessarily founded in literature. That, you know, again, women are in charge, we're in charge of our own bodies, they're not in charge of us. All right, so why would menopause be special? Just switching gears, we're done having the family, we're moving on um, to, um, to menopause again, and why would, why would menopause be special for women with epilepsy? So once again, we bring back the Botticelli's Venus, and we have hormones produced in the brain that are again going to go to the, um, the ovaries. The FSH produced in the brain is going to go to the ovaries where the estrogen and progesterone is. The brain has hormone receptors, and with aging, um, even at menopause, perimenopause, we have changes in our neuronal cells, not only in the hypothalamus and pituitary that you learned in high school biology that you forgot about till today, but also in the temporal lobes and other places. So we have brain cells that are changing as we age and receptors on brain cells. And um, that could be one factor. And so as hormones decline, the brain cell receptors may also be changing. In some cases, that might mean that that estrogen-progesterone balance ratio changed or the cells that have receptors for estrogen and progesterone um, have changed. Um, and, and so that's difficult. Um, and in point of fact, there are some women who've had ep who have had a change in seizures or actually developed seizures at menopause. Um, another aspect, I don't know if this is really supported in the literature, we could probably do a prospective study of our patients or re semi-retrospective, but for patients, for women who've been controlling their epilepsy all their lives, they're used to being in control of their epilepsy and their brain and their body. And when things go like, it's not like regular, if it's not the way it used to be, they're not happy. So if they, always, if they had premenstrual seizures and it was every 28 days and now it's every 35 days and sometimes they miss it, they really are not happy to have one thing that's out of line. They've, they've, they've put their life in order and they're not happy. And of course, nobody likes to get older. Nobody likes to have a transition in life. And often um, for many women around menopause, perimenopause, they're doing a lot. They're looking after everybody else. They're looking after their children, who may be small or large, uh, and they're often looking at, after the next generation. So taking a few more minutes to la look after yourself is important. Um, women without epilepsy can commonly have changes in cognition, and of course, women who have epilepsy don't appreciate any change in their memory. Um, they may have trouble finding the right word, um, and they may have a little bit more trouble and need to be a little bit more organized. Um, the name of this book, I love the name of this book, is Why Men Never Remember and Women Never Forget. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden when you're having a little trouble remembering something, it's a little annoying. Okay. So I, um, epilepsy can affect the age of uh, the age the onset of menopause so factors for the onset of menopause is family history smoking or not smoking other reproductive issues but epilepsy can be a factor too you can't do anything about your genetics and epilepsy it is what it is but it's a good idea not to smoke some women do get epilepsy at menopause and that has to do with those changes in hormones and receptors um, and that has been reported and women who have always had menstrual epilepsy can experience a decline in seizure control. 
Um, and in terms of the use of hormone replacement therapy, that decision really has to be based on the specific things for each woman. Um, again, at menopause, um, we talked a little bit about all of this, um, but bone health is a good I idea, and an, an osteoporosis evaluation is recommended for all women, because about 40 to 50% of women have osteoporosis around age 50. Management of symptoms related to declining estrogen is important. Um, and sometimes there, there, is, there are a few things that are really labeled, but there are some things that are effective. I tend to tell people to avoid medications which can lower the seizure threshold, and I'm cautious about the use of herbals, particularly if they haven't been screened. I always worry about what's going to be in them, I'll, although by, um, but so if you have a question, bring what you have to your doctor to look at it. And again, there is off-label use of medicines for symptoms of menopause, including gabapentin, which is Neurontin, which has been used. Um, one thing that I want you to remember is if you're thinking about, if you're dealing with uh, osteoporosis, vitamin D supplement, the bottom line is we should all be on some vitamin D, right? Um, vitamin D is probably, you know, even if you don't have epilepsy or you're not taking seizure medicines, we're all probably a little vitamin D deficient. Uh, for people under the age of 35, if, uh, it's one thing that we can do to prevent multiple sclerosis, which is a rare entity. But we all don't get enough exercise. We spend way too much time indoors. Um, so we should all be get, take some vitamin D. Um, the big box stores, the Costco, BJ's, you can buy a year's supply for $10. Done, right? And um, even if you don't have a membership, you just find a friend who does. Give them $10. It's much better than going into the store yourself because you'll buy more stuff. At least I would. So, so that's a very inexpensive way to do it if it's not covered. Um, and then off-label use of medications for menopause is also, um, you know, just talk to your doctor. All right. So in closing, um, um, in, you know, I think that women with epilepsy have really a lot of, um, of transitions. Um, and, and over the course of, of a woman's reproductive life, say from 13 to 50, um, there's a lot that, that young women go through. Sexuality, trust, being open, the vulnerability of having, of having sex when you have epilepsy, um, especially for very young women, women finding the right contraceptive, and even talking to more than one person. A typical 17-year-old might just talk to a, a, a nurse practitioner about choosing a contraceptive, but a teenager with epilepsy might be talking to the neuro this doctor and that doctor in a conversation. Um, and then going back if it's not the right me medicine for you. Um, and then obviously the hormonal fluctuations when hormones are linked to seizures and then again at menopause. But I think that, um, you know, as is true in this room, um, women with epilepsy really um, do an amazing job. And in the, there are two quotes from, um, from Netflix from Kimmy, Sch Kimmy Schmidt, and um, I thought I would share both of them with you. The first of them one is, I'm pretty but tough like a diamond, or beef jerky <laughs> in a ball gown. And um, an edited quote from Kimmy Schmidt is also, I thought the world had ended. I thought I would die there, but I survived because that's what women do. We eat a bag of dirt, pass it in the kiddie pool, and move on. 